Now, I've, I've called tonight's subject, The Real Thing. We have a table at home in our hall, round, I suppose, two feet six across, supported by three legs, carved to look like elephants' heads. We bought it in India years and years ago, and at first we called it the ebony table. And then somebody came who knew about these things and said, you know, that table in your hall isn't really ebony. It's only redwood. And they oil it and make it look black, and then people think it's ebony. So now we call it the elephant table. And true enough, if you make a little nick in it anywhere, the wood is not black. It's a very dark, dark red. And the idea is to keep it so oiled that it always looks black. But my wife and I and all the children know it isn't the real thing. It's not ebony. It's redwood. You've seen ladies wearing ornaments in the lapel of their coat. Pretty things that shine brightly and look to eyes like mine as if they were diamonds. But I suppose some of them, if they were diamonds, would be worth a fortune. A and really, it must be confessed, some of them belong not to age-long diamonds pressed under the earth for hundreds of years, but, uh, shall we say, belong to the early Woolworth period. <laughs> they are not the real thing. They look very pretty. Don't take them off, anybody. <laughs> they look very pretty, but they're not the real thing, are they? I can remember a friend of mine who was a jeweler taking me into, into his shop once, and there on, on, on a little bit of black velvet, he put side by side a ring with a most wonderful stone in it and a brooch with a wonderful stone in it, or so it appeared. And then he said, now I'm going to turn all the lights out except one spotlight on that of black velvet. Do you know, one flashed with a white light, but the diamond might have had a tiny blue electric light within it. It shone with a pure blue ray to one's eye. There was no doubt that was the real thing. Now, I thought it might be valuable if we could carry this idea we have about the real thing over into religion tonight. Those of you who are real musicians know what real music is. Those of you who are artists know what real art is. Those of you who are sculptors know what, what the real thing is. Now, can we, can we carry these thoughts over into the realm of religion? Can we find out what the real thing is? More importantly, can we find out if we've got it? Or do you think one of the great problems of the church today is that they have a large number of people with a spurious substitute, something that looks black, uh, bright, something that is not to be discarded, get this point, not to be cast away any more than you will cast away the ornament on the lapel of your coat or I will throw the table out of my house. But can we learn whether what we have is the real thing or something that looks like it but isn't quite? And can we learn tonight how to decide, how to assess the real thing? I can remember years ago reading about a young woman who looked after an aging father and mother with great devotion, and in brackets, one really does want to pay a tribute to some women who've given up the thought of marriage and given up the thought of career, and they've looked after their, 
aging parents. And every morning she got up early and opened a tea tin on the lid of which was a picture of the Rock of Gibraltar. I can nearly see that, you know, the blue tin and the picture that she must have got so sick of looking at. And every afternoon she made their tea and she opened the tin with the picture of Gibraltar on the lid. And then I was going to say in the fullness of times, but a little later than that, they passed away. And they rightly left their money to her. And she fulfilled a desire that had been with her all her days, a desire to travel. And she set off for the Mediterranean. And I can almost repeat her words. One morning I opened my porthole and there was the rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> she said I could have tossed a ship's biscuit onto it. <laughs> ship's biscuits being what they are, I'm sure she could. <laughs> there it was, she said, the real thing. You're not forgetting that all these illustrations are parables. The table, the brooch, the rock. Are we being content? On the other hand, are we being almost bored by a picture of something that has never become real? And can we tonight take steps to make it come real. Because, men and women, I believe that there is a thing called the Christian experience. Now, mark this very carefully. Not of standard size and shape wrapped up in a parcel and the same for everybody. There is, however, I think, a convincing experience as different as personalities are different. Yours may be quite different from mine and ours from somebody else's, but equally valid, equally convincing, and, and all the real thing. After all, you can have diamonds cut in almost any shape, any size. You can have them with this facet and that facet, but they're all the real thing, real diamonds. I believe there, there is such a thing as an authentic Christian experience. To possess it is to feel that you're in touch with reality. And I think thousands of people go all the way through life content with a picture on a lid, content with a Woolworth brooch, content with a redwood table, and they wonder that Christianity, which is alleged to have such marvelous power, which once spread through the known world, which turned the world upside down and changed men and women's lives, Christianity, whose sacred book has been translated into every known language, Christianity, which has altered men on all shores, under all skies, through all the centuries, they wonder, they can't understand they say, it's never done that for me. Because they haven't got the real thing. The real thing. You know, in the winter days, in the autumn days, which probably we shan't be able to distinguish from the summer days, <laughs> but in the autumn days, there will be mists that descend on Hoban and Bloomsbury. And if you look at a mist, it looks just the same whether you're in Bloomsbury or whether you're in Switzerland or whether you're in the Himalayas. A mist looks like a mist. But if you're in Switzerland, there comes at least surely one morning when the sun breaks out and you see the everlasting snow. Oh, you say, this is Switzerland. This isn't a dream, this isn't a picture. 
This is what I came to see. And even if the mist closes down upon you again and looks just like a mist in Bloomsbury, you know that behind the mist there is a reality. And, and nothing could ever make you believe that you were mistaken. You would say, I know, I have seen it. They, though thou then should smite him from his glory, do you remember? Blind and tormented, maddened and alone, even on a cross would he maintain his story, and though in hell would whisper, I have known the real thing. And men and women, if you go on as I pray and hope you will and that I will to find the real thing after tonight. The mists will come down again. You won't be able to live on the shining heights all the time. No Christian does. No saint ever has. Our Lord himself knew the fog and mist of doubt and temptation and desolation. But oh, if once you see the shining reality, you can never deny it again in your heart. When once you have found the real thing, it is self-authenticating. And when you've seen it, there'll be such a difference in you. I've seen this happen so often, and I mustn't stay to give you case after case. But instead of being people who want assurances of the truth of Christianity, you will become evidence of the truth of Christianity yourself. Just as in Switzerland, when you've seen the mountains, you don't have to have somebody who says to you, you know, there are mountains behind that mist. You know, you have seen, you know the real thing. Now, I want to suggest three ways in which we can assess the real thing, test it out. There must be 33 ways. But these three ways, to my mind, are sound. One, the real Christian tries to react in all circumstances, in all crises, in all decisions, in the spirit of Jesus Christ. He doesn't take one sentence in the Gospels and think that words said to one individual in one set of circumstances apply to all individuals in all circumstances. He doesn't take what well may be a mistranslation of the words of Jesus or what he meant to convey and base his experience on that. He lets the totality of the four Gospels make their impression on his mind until he feels that in his mind he's got a picture of the real Christ living a quality of life treading a path that makes life full of sense, purposeful, beautiful, meaningful. And he said, I'm going to follow that. Any man who does that, in my estimation, is a Christian. I don't mind what he believes. I don't mind what services he goes to, what ritual he follows out, what creeds he recites. I don't mind what he thinks about the Bible. But if he looks at Christ as he is reflected in the Gospels taken as a whole and says, I'm going to be Christ's man. And I'm going to try, whenever I have to make a decision or a choice or meet a crisis, to react in his way. That man is on the way to the real thing. And he who does it has found the real thing. The real thing. Now, all these people won't believe the same things. If, 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 if these assessments that I want to convey to you are correct, you see, you can be just as good a Christian, a Roman Catholic, as a Salvationist or a Quaker, a high churchman or a low churchman, or even a Methodist. 
yes, there are some who are real Christians. <laughs> and I've heard that there are some in the congregational denomination who are really trying very hard. You see, being saved, that phrase, being saved, it isn't that something that, that happens, uh, and that's the end of it. I love that phrase in the Acts. There were added to the church daily those who were being saved, see? Those who were finding the real thing and being changed by it. So the first test, I think, is that the real Christian tries to react to life's demands in the Spirit of Christ. And the second is this. The real Christian senses that he is only at the beginning of a journey. Now, I hope I can get over to you the difference between being at the end of your wandering and being at the end of your journey. Have you ever been lost? I have. And I have friends who've been lost. I have had friends who have wandered in a jungle all night, their feet tripping over the undergrowth, their faces slapped with the low branches, blindly plowing through jungle, and then finding a road, one man said to me, I could have knelt down and kissed it. It wasn't at the end of his journey, but he was at the end of his wandering. When you find the real thing, you don't say there is nothing else to discover. Thank God I'm saved. That's the end of it. You say, now I have found the road that will take me home, that will bring me out where I want to be. This is the road. This is the real thing. This isn't a path that ends in a desert. This isn't a path that ends in a mountain precipice that you can't get up. Not the end of the journey, but the end of the wandering. The beginning of the road home. Now, I think, I think that in all his teaching, Jesus was trying to convey that to men. I say trying because a thing that was so patent to him was so hard to get over to the world. And I think that that is at the heart of so many of the parables. Do you notice that Jesus calls it finding the kingdom of heaven, finding the real thing? And do you notice how he talks? In parable after parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. As though he can't say what it's like, as though, as though language is like a vessel that is weighed down with meaning to the waterline and nearly sinking with significance. And he can't, he can't fill it full enough with meaning lest it sink and leave men's minds puzzled and bewildered. Picture after picture, the kingdom of heaven the real thing, see? The real thing. He says it's like this. For instance, he says, it's like a man who's plowing a field. And when you get home, you might look up the reference. He says it's like a man plowing a field. Can you imagine the wooden plow? Can you imagine, well, I imagine uphill on a November morning in the driving rain and the wind against him. A Monday morning, I think, you know? All dreary and miserable and... Oh, he's plowing this wretched field. It isn't even his field. He's got to plow it. And then suddenly the plow strikes something, and that something glitters, and he knows the Jewish law, that treasure found in a field belongs to the finder, not to the owner of the field, but to make sure he goes, says Jesus, and sells all that he has to buy that field. Would you do that? for the real thing. Jesus says it's as valuable as that. He makes a picture of a pearl merchant looking for goodly pearls. Oh, he's got dozens of them. He runs them out on that little black mat that you see in a native bazaar. 
even to these days. This is a nice one, that's a good one. And so on and so on. And then in the story of Jesus, the pearl merchant finds a pearl and sells all that he has to possess that. Oh, men and women, we haven't begun. We haven't begun, have we, to discover what the real thing is. I couldn't help thinking when we were singing tonight or below our breath were following the choir as they intoned those words. We thank thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. Shall I shock you if I say, I've never met anybody who really means that. Do you? Do I? We thank thee for our creation, preservation, all the blessings of this life, all of them. Would you give up your health, your home, your dear ones, your happiness, your job, your success, your fame, your academic honors, would you give the, would you put them down in one lump and say, let the whole lot go if I can only have this. But above all, does Christ mean that to you? If so, you've got the real thing. That's what Jesus said it was worth. He went and sold all that he had and bought that field. The merchant sold all his pearls that he might buy this one pearl of great price. Jesus says, not my words, Jesus says the real thing is like that. And there is a third way of assessing it. I think the real Christian wants, underline wants, to pass on what he has found. Now, I think this is extremely difficult. We're all terribly shy, and we, we, we do realize, and we ought to realize, that another person's spiritual experience is a very secret, sacred, and holy thing. Don't let's have any burglaring of the human soul. But I read a story, a true story, some years ago, told by Provost Erskine Hill of St. Andrew's Cathedral in Aberdeen. And I've never got this story out of my mind. He tells of two men who were partners in a business, and they met each other every day in business, and they had lunch every day, and they visited one another's houses, and they were great friends. And every Sunday morning, one of them took the tram to the golf course, and the other took the same tram to church. And one Sunday morning, the golfer said to the churchgoer, you know, you are, you are a damned old hypocrite. He said, what? He said, we're the greatest friends, aren't we? Oh, yes, he said, but look, but look. For 20 years, I have got off this tram to go to golf, and you have got off this tram to go to church. And if you're sincere, I am in great danger, and I am missing something tremendously important and valuable, and you have never once, never once, in a letter, in a word, in a message, You've never lifted a finger to win me away from something that is unimportant to something which you pretend is the most important thing in the world. I find the challenge of that story goes home to me, men and women. Doesn't it to you? If you and I had the real thing, sh shouldn't we want, shouldn't we want to pass it on? Oh, not by breaking down other people's privacies, but perhaps lending them a book, perhaps bringing them to church, perhaps writing them a letter, perhaps engaging 
in prayer for them. You see, if I had cancer and you knew the cure, you would write to me, wouldn't you? If you knew the cure, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I mustn't break in on him. After all, cancer's a very private affair. Oh, bless you, you would say, look, I, I know something that could make you well. I, do, I remember telling those of you who were with me in the old days about visiting a little park near my London home where old men discuss their symptoms. I join them now on the front and... <laughs> Do you remember the story how I listened while these old boys talked about a certain illness? And one said, well, I think so-and-so is very good. And another said, well, I've heard this remedy is very efficacious. And then a dear old chap whom I could have hugged nearly, though that would have surprised him. A dear old boy said, well, I'll tell you what cured me. Ah, oh, that was the witness that counted. That was, the, that was the witness that counted. He didn't say, I've heard that. I believe that. It is possible that. He said, it did it for me. Oh, men and women, can you say that about the Christian religion? You say, well, I support it. I think it's doing a jolly good work. I wish the churches weren't so divided. And I wish they wouldn't read all these difficult passages from the Old Testament. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and all this, and I wish that, and I wish that, and why don't they this, and why don't they that? But could you, in the secret of your own heart, look into the eyes of Christ and say, I do thank God for all the blessings of this life, but above all for you? Above all for you? And could you lead another person into that experience? If so, you've got the real thing.